And the first thing we want to start on is, is uh, captured this nice cover of The Economist uh, from earlier this month, actually about a week ago. And uh, the, the cover was, uh, will inflation ever return? Uh, there's a lot of joking about uh, magazine covers and whether they're sort of um, contrarian indicators or not. I'll sort of leave that to the viewers to sort of make their own decision. But um, I think this sort of captures uh, some of the zeitgeist of the moment in that um, there's a lot of folks that are looking for inflation to return in 2021. I think there's a pretty good thesis for that. Um, and in fact, if you want to um, take a look here, we at uh, Double Line do our own forecast of inflation. Um, and what we anticipate going in through 2021 is we do think we think that inflation is going to bump up. Uh, currently, we're sitting here today. We're just over one percent. We think uh, through May, J uh, June of next of 2021, we think inflation is going to more than double up into the mid to high two percent. Uh, and then it'll sort of come back down. And you know, part of this, a, a significant part of this is really just the sort of the base effects of energy. Energy is one of the more uh, volatile contributors to inflation. And so as you uh, remember, energy on a day um, this year actually traded negative, but you know, so I can just sort of summarize and say- it Super cheap, energy yeah, was exactly. super cheap. <laughs> <laughs> it traded a very low price. And so just the base effect that, you know, the way that, that inflation is thought of uh, the, the year over year change will sort of lead to this, this high number. This is not taking into account any of the other factors that are out there to, to, um, for the most part. And so, you know, you look at this and you have to sort of think about where, you know, sitting here at the end of the year, uh, we're, we've moved past some of the major uh, risks for the year with the vaccines work, the US election, would we have a fall wave? Check, we, did, we do have the fall wave, um, uh, unfortunately. But you know, think out. You know, four or five, six months. We uh, again will um, hopefully be in the midst of a continued rollout of a successful vaccine. Uh, the economy hopefully will be recovering. We'll, we'll be moving past the winter months. There's definitely uh, a seasonal component here. It's uh, it's bad in the summer and it's really bad in the in the fall and the winter. Um, and so the spring, there's reasons to be hopeful, even uh, with the vaccine notwithstanding. And then you have this sort of this base effect that we think we're going to see in inflation. So you could really, I think, see how the narrative. Uh, might shift in the middle of the year, even if it's not sustained. Um, beyond that, we'll wa have to watch how things develop. But I think it's really interesting to think about the trajectory of inflation over the next four, five, six months, and what that might mean for interest rates and sort of the tone of the market and the sentiment of investors in general. Just going, going back to when oil went negative, there was so much other bad stuff going on. You were just kind of looking at that party screen and being a saying, thank God I don't trade energy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it, you couldn't even just focus on it because there's carnage everywhere, but I was reading somewhere, um, they talked to a lot of people that, uh, you know, work at these, uh, uh, commodity brokerage houses and they, the, the, their quotes were that the market did exactly what it was supposed to. Like it was, it, it should have gone negative. There was too much supply. Nobody could take physical delivery. It should, the prices went to where they should be. So it was a efficient market. So there was nothing weird about it. it for someone that that's what they do every day. Yeah, I, I've, I've remembered several times over the past uh, decade that investors have talked about the potential for natural gas to go negative. Um, and so the, the, the sort of the theory behind that, exactly what you spoke about, um, what, you know, which is basically storage capacity sort of being uh, reached, uh, we saw that play out in, in an even larger market, which is um, you know, oil. So it's pretty, it pretty fascinating to watch. As you mentioned, there's a lot of other things going on at that time. So I think you know, maybe that's something we'll be talking about more as things settle down here. The uniqueness of all of the different things, which I could probably list a hundred different things that sort of happened that were very unique for 2020. So that's uh, that's inflation. You know, I think for us, it's it's really sort of there, there's a lot of talk of inflation now, and I think that'll um, you see that in um, flows into tips funds. Um, we ourselves anticipate inflation to sort of move up. All else um, notwithstanding, just sort of the base effects based on what we see happening with. Um, uh, energy and how that's going to translate to inflation. Um, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of investors that are expecting uh, a steepening yield curve. I think you could you could put us in that camp uh, with the sort of the caveat that we're keeping an eye on some of the risks, the vaccine rollout that I mentioned, and the potential for 
um, less stimulus, more political gridlock. I, you know, just sort of going back on that topic, uh, I think it's generally been viewed that gridlock is sort of a good thing. Um, I think in this case, um, the potential for stimulus coming out of such uh, a deep crisis um, would actually probably be um, better for the economy and um, probably markets as well. But uh, there's a real, you know, there's, there's a narrative building about inflation. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about central bank um, liquidity and how that's sort of filtering through the economy and, you know, whether these checks to, um, uh, to uh, basically un unemployed will continue. Um, but we also just from the sort of a technical aspect see that uh, inflation is going to rise over the next six months, pretty likely. So it's, it's going to fit that narrative. The real interesting part will be, you know, how it sort of plays out past that. It's called the second half of the year when inflation might sort of moderate back to 2%. You know, I mean, one of the things that I think was so different this time around was um, there wasn't really a moral hazard. There was a huge moral hazard during the global financial crisis, bailing out the evil banks, so on and so forth. Um, where maybe much like the, the last world war, the, um, you know, this was a, something un, you know, unforeseen that hit everyone and we needed to kind of do whatever it takes, right, to, to make it through this. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, it, obviously there's a lot of controversy um, about that within the market, but um, if you're asking folks not to go to work, if you're asking businesses to, to shutter, uh, you can't just, you know, make that request uh, as a society and not try to fill that gap and not try to let those um, folks not eat or not pay rent. So, you know, we, we had to sort of do that. Um, and then the question is really how we decide to sort of proceed going forward with some of the inequalities and sort of uh, excesses that had built up over the last decade that really got, um, again, I sort of, again, a broken record, but it's really just sort of uh, got exposed even more during the COVID uh, pandemic. All right. Um, okay. So with that said, I'm going to, you know, just have a little bit of conversation here about the interest rates. Um, I mentioned, I alluded to earlier, uh, the, you know, had we had come out of the World War II with a high level of debt to GDP. And in that, um, in the years after, uh, well, the years actually in World War II and beyond World War II, um, there's a lot of talk about yield curve control, yield curve caps. Um, what happened was uh, uh, basically there was a um, capped interest rate market up and down the curve. Um, and we spent some time sort of looking at this. And what we, what we did here is the Fed essentially capped uh, the uh, tenure at two and a half percent for almost 10 years from 1942 to 1951. Um, and um, that, you know, that provided a lot of stability in the market. Again, you have to think about back in the, the mid 1940s, there was a lot, to, a lot of debt, government debt uh, that was out there. And so, um, you know, of course, the, the Fed didn't want, uh, the Fed and the Treasury didn't want rates to really sort of spike during that time frame. And um, this next slide here is looking at what happened in, to inflation. So um, again, same chart, we've got the shaded area, which is the, that two and a half percent on the 10 year treasury. And the red line is uh, CPI or, or inflation. And you can see inflation um, in that time frame. It was, it was pretty wild. Obviously those were different times, but we saw inflation in the, in the decade of the 1940s go from zero to 20%. All the while the 10 year sort of held steady because the Fed was capping rates uh, at that sort of 10%. And so, if you want to think about, you know, today uh, we're sitting again with high, high debt levels um, coming out of a crisis where there's, you know, again, this, this topic we've been talking about, there's more, there's more discussion of continued fiscal spending, whether it's infrastructure or yet another stimulus bill uh, after the Biden, Biden administration um, takes office. And, um, you know, one of, one of the ways to sort of work off that debt is you can just outright default, seems pretty unlikely to me. And the other way is uh, you can sort of, you know, as you can have the Fed per perhaps uh, cap yields and, you know, inflation might run a little bit hot and that sort of can work down the debt as the uh, nominal uh, GDP is running at a higher level. Basically, you're, you're, you let your GDP sort of catch up with your, uh, um, with your debt levels in, in nominal terms. Um, but I think it's really interesting to look at what happened during the last crisis. It had a lot of debt, capped interest rates, inflation was moving all over the place. And as, you know, you saw in one of the earlier slides I showed, that debt to GDP number sort of came down over time. So I think um, whether um, we run the exact same playbook, that's certainly out there, it's being discussed. I think the bigger question for the market now is what, it, what, what a Fed yield uh, cap would look like and where that might come into play. Uh, I don't have good answers on that, but I think that's a theme that we'll be thinking about 
uh, not just next year, but in the coming years, as we have um, all this debt increase running large federal, uh, uh, federal budget deficits. Um, so it's interesting to sort of pull back um, to looking at what happened in history and sort of putting that in context. Okay, so moving to uh, more, more uh, the current decade, the current year. Um, one of the indicators we like to look at, um, we all talk about this, is uh, looking at the copper gold ratio. That's just the price of copper divided by the cop uh, price of gold. And we look at that versus the US 10 year treasury top panel. The uh, black line is the copper gold ratio. And then the red line is the US 10 year treasury yield. Uh, chart goes back three years. You can see there's, there's been a relationship. And then more recently, there's been a bit of this divergence where the copper gold ratio has gone up. I mentioned sure. in the beginning of the presentation, copper was up uh, well over 25%. You can see that um, in the lower panel, we, we broke out copper and we broke out gold and you can see the copper's really been making a move up. Um, I, I you know, sort of had a conversation internally where I threw it out there that I'm not sure how well this, this, this indicator may work in the coming years, especially if we go back to the prior slide where we do end up in a world where we have yield curve control. It could very well be the case. And you know, we couldn't do this in the 1940s because uh, gold price was, uh, was basically fixed. But uh, it'll be interesting to think about how this plays out in the next three, four, five years. We might have to drop this from our, uh, our thinking because the copper gold ratio might end up going up still. Um, have to sort of wait and see how that, you know, how the, the dynamic between copper and gold plays out. But uh, we might see 10 year treasury just sort of stop at some level and bounce around there. So uh, it's an interesting chart. Maybe we're, maybe, maybe, maybe we're seeing a precursor of that dynamic just seen in the, the, the divergence we've seen over the past couple months. I guess someday maybe copper or Bitcoin. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, and again, thinking about 2021, this comes from JP Morgan. There's, a, there's the expectation of a lot of issuance of treasuries. Uh, their, their estimate is uh, 1.8 trillion. And this chart goes back to 2011. That would really uh, dwarf uh, everything else. It, you know, obviously 2020, you might look at that and say, oh, that's interesting. How come there was actually a net a, a net negative issuance. And, and again, this is a net of Fed purchases. So uh, the big the big plug here is what will Fed purchases be in, in 2021? Yeah. I don't think JP Morgan or anyone else knows. So this is really just sort of showing that there's an expectation of a lot of supply um, coming to the treasury market. So you have you know inflation moving up the first three months. Um, you have the expectation of this recovery. The vaccine rollout goes well. Um, you have that, you know, that going on. And then you have a lot of government borrowing and this high expectation for uh, issuance. And so the question again comes back into play in the last series of charts. What does the Fed do? Do we move into a world of yield curve control? It seems like the market thinks there will be because historically at some point when rates go higher, it's bad for risk assets. Like one of the, like equities, one of the reasons that um, or one of the reasons people point to on why stocks have done so well is that, well, interest rates are so low. So like, look at the earnings yield on stocks. It's actually higher than the yield on bonds. So, you know, there's, you know, can't, can't make any returns in bonds. So you got to increase your allocation to equity. There's all, all these different reasons of why low rates helps other asset classes, whether it's equities or real estate, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, you look at this and you see, okay, well, there's going to be huge bond issuance. You would think that would put pressure on rates unless there's somebody to buy it all. That's right. right. Which, which, so it almost seems like the market is already expecting that, right? Yeah, yeah I think that makes sense. Um, you know, the other thing's just sort of fitting in line with, with what you were saying is just as an economy, we don't have the chart in here, but the US economy, financial services or the, you know, the financialization of the US economy has just really increased over the last couple of decades. And the, one of the um, impacts of that is that it's, it becomes a lot harder to let interest rates rise when you have so much of your economy that's pegged to you know, interest rates and you know, wealth and how all that sort of transfers to the economy. So it, it's even more uh, of a reason to um, think that interest rates will um, be sort of supported or, or I should say bond purchases. There may be bond purchases or the interest rate markets may be sort of supported uh, by the Fed just because it gets more difficult to see interest rates rise. We saw that in, over the last couple of years. Uh, and we saw that really, you know, back in 2006, 2007, just, you know, helped to sort of contribute to the housing uh, bur uh, bubble burst that we actually saw. Yep. Okay, so that's interest rates. Um, you know, again, I think the narrative for uh, 2021 will be, you know, particularly early in the year. Um, hopefully we're having a recovery. Um, we've got this, this uh, inflation con uh, contributing to, early, you know, the first half of the year at least. We've got a lot of supply of treasuries coming to the market. Um, and then we, 
you have to wonder if we're going to end up in the playbook from the 1940s and the early 1950s of, of sort of yield curve control um, and at what point that sort of comes into play. And with that, I'll move to a couple slides here on credit. Um, I think, you know, that what this chart shows is, uh, and we don't have investment grade corporates on here, but we do have high, the black line is uh, high yield spreads and the red line is leveraged loans. Those are floating rate um, leveraged loans. And then we have, uh, we picked a, a component of the structured finance market, the CMBS commercial mortgage backed securities, the triple B. So it's sort of the mezzanine, the middle of the capital structure. And, you know, as a firm, we've been, you know, particularly over the last, uh, I'd say the last, you know, really since the sort of the summer, really been favoring structured finance um, in large part because it's been slower to recover and sort of catch up to the rest of the markets. And I think this chart really shows nicely uh, that line of thinking here. You can see uh, really high yield spreads are kind of back to where they were um, at, you know, pre-COVID. So we're sitting at a 379 spread. You're kind of, this is kind of where we were pre-COVID. So the black line's kind of recovered. Um, and then you go to levered loans, which is an area that we think, you know, looks interesting for 2021. And there you see it's, it's definitely on its way, but it's not as recovered as, um, as the high yield uh, market is. And then all the way at the top is uh, the CMBS triple B market. Obviously, commercial real estate is really exposed to uh, the COVID pandemic. You've got the hotel sector in there. You have office and a lot of question marks about um, how many folks will go back to the office. You've got retail, which was already having the, um, the retail apocalypse effectively over the last few years. So you have all of those parts of the CMBS market and you see it here, that part of the market is really not at all recovered. I think as a, you know, as a firm, we generally are pretty interested in the structured finance market because you know, a, this, is a, this is a good example, but uh, a lot of the markets have still, still have some room to sort of recover. Whereas if you look at the investment grade corporate market and even the high yield market here, um, those markets have really sort of recovered. Now we know why the investment grade market has recovered the quickest uh, and it really got explicit uh, government support from the Fed. So it makes sense that market would recover as quickly as possible in those areas that have not yet um, received that explicit support that are more dependent on the recovery. Uh, that's an area where we think that there's uh, more opportunity as we look towards 2021. It's the, the move in March is, was just incredible. Um, having we, we both lived together uh, in a different building, but uh, down the street in downtown LA through the previous crisis, it just took so much longer for prices to decline. And I, when I meet with investors, I, I tell them my theory of liquidity, which turned out to be almost exactly right. I wish it wasn't right, but I told them that because of all the regulation, um, the banks just don't have a the uh, ability and b the desire to balance sheet. You know, like they did in 09. In 09, even at the bottom, they were taking down positions and trying to make money doing that, doing trading. So the Wall Street would not be there if for any reason everyone had to sell at the same time. I didn't know what that reason would be. I thought maybe it was like a good old fashioned recession, you know? <laughs> um, and then usually the next marginal buyer is hedge funds, but if prices drop too quickly, they even stop buying because they can't deal with the mark to market. They'll get redemptions, right? Like money managers would get marked every day, hedge funds, maybe they get marked every quarter. And so then there used to be the prop desks, but because of Volcker rule, the prop desks weren't there anymore. So if the Wall Street's not going to be there, the hedge funds aren't going to be there, the money managers are getting the outflows, we're the ones selling, um, the prop desks aren't there, then who would be left? And in 09, we saw that the next marginal buyer was private equity and they stepped in kind of like 20, 25% yield. Like that's the cost of money to lock up money for 10 years. So my good news for clients, so I can have some good news was that there's this new pool of capital called private credit, private debt. There's about a trillion dollars of equity capital raised. And my thesis was that they would step in and they would step, step in when they could get kind of like mid teens returns, which I thought would be starting to buy at around a thousand over. Because we have a private fund like that. And that's when I would start buying is when stuff was a thousand over. Of course, we were fully invested going into March. So we couldn't buy. Um, and that's, that's almost exactly what happened. Once Wall Street didn't provide liquidity, the prices dropped like free fall within, I think it was four business days, three to four business days till things were trading at a thousand over. And that's exactly who stepped in was the private credit, the private debt that locked up money. So you look at this chart and that's kind of where high yield bottom. I remember 1200, kind of like the number that, that sticks in my head. But of course, because of the Fed, because of all the stimulus, everything kind of came back much more quickly. The other thing that was pretty wild to me too, 
was how much quicker the bond market came back, like people issuing bonds in the marketplace. Um, one, the banks weren't going under, that helps. And then I think B, or, or secondly, um, there wasn't this huge overhang of assets. So as, as a money manager, we had no choice but to go buy a new issue again. And so the new issue market came back, right? So yeah. it, was, it, was, it's, it's, it was really uh, so different, in, you know, similar in some ways, but so different than 08, 09. How did yeah. you feel about that, that same yeah. time period? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you, we, we keep, you know, this, the same thing keeps coming up. Everything's sort of happening a lot quicker. And I feel like uh, this crisis, everything happened a lot quicker. I mean, you come in in February and things were, concern was rising. And then uh, everything happened in March and it happened really quick. And it was, I think, in many ways, you know, sitting you know, back again as a firm, working all working together in 2008, 2009, uh, there was this this fear of what happens if you come in one day and there's no buyers and you're just you know there's just these these um, these gaps these gap moves down like really big gap moves down in a really short order of time. Now we we saw that over a longer period of time and back in 2008 2009, but we really got to see that this time. It's sort of you know not just staring into the abyss. It, we weren't in the abyss for a while, and as you mentioned, um, you know there's there was opportunistic investors that came in, and I also think you know the the the, the Fed coming in and providing these backstops gave uh, a lot of those investors comfort to step back into the market in a big way. And, and you know, as you mentioned, the opportunistic investors have come back to the market as well. But the idea of everything happening really quick, uh, we're see, we've seen a lot of evidence of that this year. Um, and so, you know, we talked, we, we spent a little bit of time talking about uh, 10-year treasury rates. Uh, there's a forecast. Here's Credit Suisse saying that they think the 10-year treasury will end 2021 at 1.3%. So basically up, you know, some 40 odd basis points. Um, and so, you know, this is, I've mentioned this before, there's uh, leveraged loans. Leveraged loans are floating rate. They're like high yield bonds, um, but basically that they're floating rate. There's other differences. I really just want to sort of simplify that. Um, and this is looking at the flows into leveraged loans compared to the 10 year treasury. And I think Credit Suisse is, is sort of, putting out there an interesting potential. Um, and that is, you know, if we do see rates move uh, up, some of the corners of credit with less um, interest, direct interest rate exposure might be become more interesting. I think you can throw into that bucket um, uh, securities like CMBS that are at deep discounts. Um, you can throw shorter rate um, uh, credit securities like RMBS in there, uh, non-agency RMBS. You can put uh, leveraged loans in there, probably uh, ABS and CLOs. So, um, you know, with the full recovery and, uh, you know, all of these other things that we're all um, either hoping or sort of uh, assuming that will happen in 2021, I think this path becomes uh, definitely possible. I've mentioned some of the headwinds right now, and probably the number one is the vaccine complications. And then there's a sort of more gridlock in DC. Um, but this is something to sort of keep your eyes on as, as you think about credit, certainly something we're thinking about. Um, as we put our portfolios together and as we sort of get ready to sort of navigate through 2021. Yeah, this is, a, I think it's an excellent uh, slide to look at. Yep. Okay, so that's credit. Um, again, we, we're, we're generally favoring, you know, more structured finance, parts of the, you know, things like le leverage loans, shorter duration assets um, are areas that we're, we're, you know, pretty interested in. And uh, I think I'll take a, a little bit of time here talking about uh, equities. So with that. Why own anything else? They only go up. <laughs> <laughs> There's really no reason, uh, at least historically. <laughs> One of the things I definitely want to throw out there is um, we all know, I showed it early on that this has been, I think you could call it a, a pretty good year for equities, if not a tremendous year, particularly for the NASDAQ. Um, but also in the midst of this year, there's been some really interesting, perhaps trend shifts of long-term trends, um, trends that have been in place for a while. A lot of what we look at um, at Double Line when we have our macro meetings is look at different asset classes relative to each other. I think, you know, charts are very telling. You can get a lot of information from a chart and you can really get a lot of information when you look at two assets relative to each other. And every so often you can uh, really see and um, maybe sort of speculate or start to develop a thesis that there's um, some uh, deeper shifts that are uh, happening underneath uh, in financial markets underneath the surface. And this first chart here is the S&P 500 growth. Uh, the S&P 500, we all know about that. They also, um, separate uh, the S&P 500 into different baskets. And so you can look at, in this case, the equities with the most growth, and then you look at the equities that have the most, are assumed to be more of the value orientation. And so this is a ratio between the two. And here you can see 
um, that this, this line bottomed out in the mid, uh, mid early 2000s. Again, at that time, value, value had basically outperformed from the top of the last uh, of the bubble, the last bubble we had back in 2000, I'm talking about the, the tech bubble, the internet bubble, and value outperformed for about five, six years. And then it bottomed out and really through the crisis and over the last 15 years, growth, growth stocks have been outperforming value during that time. And then we saw this year something a bit more interesting where value appears, you know, there's, there could be false starts. We might be looking at a false start, but just given how steep the slope has been uh, with growth to value this year, and then the quick reversal can certainly lead one to sort of maybe speculate that we're seeing a trend shift here. And in the bottom, uh, it's, it's a pretty, <laughs> it's a lot of stuff down there. So it might get a little complicated, but basically this is looking at the daily changes in that ratio. And what's worth pointing out is what we've highlighted. The biggest underperformance of growth versus value ever, ever is a long time. This chart really goes back to 1994. So I'd say since 1994, was on uh, November 9th, just after the election. I think that's pretty close to when the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine uh, was announced or the results. And you can see that, that there was a major rotation on that day. It was really the biggest day of, um, of that we saw there at, you know, on, on this ratio was back, uh, back then. And we saw the last time it even came close was right, you know, as we sort of reached the period of the last bubble when growth sort of outperformed value. So I think it's interesting and I'll, I've got a series of charts here just sort of you know, wondering how this might be shifting uh, over time. Um, but this has been a multi-decade uh, uh, trend that, that may be in the midst of sort of uh, rotating. Yeah, we, we've been uh, mentioning this. We, we've been using Russell uh, 1000 growth and value. And it was like the most, uh, the outperformance was like the highest since, you know, the mid 90s or early 2000s, as you mentioned. So we've been talking about that. We, we weren't calling the bottom. We were just saying it's something definitely worth watching because if we come out of this secular stagnation that we've been in with just central banks, trying to stimulate the economy and you move into that that fiscal like we have um, then you could finally see some of those more cyclical names that are in that value bucket really start to uh, grow their earnings and 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 you know see see investors go there and, and I think it's probably one of the more interesting things to watch in the equity market right now yeah yeah absolutely you know the, this ratio correlates with a lot of other things I mean value stocks can, can correlate with interest rates and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's certainly something that we're, we're keeping an eye on. We look at this chart um, weekly in our, in our macro meetings. Um, another chart, uh, you, you sort of hinted at the Russell uh, 1000, or Russell, I'm sorry, value and growth. In this case, we're looking at the NASDAQ versus the Russell 2000. NASDAQ um, is mostly tech stocks. Russell 2000 is you know, small cap stocks with a, you know, a broad array of, of, of sector exposure. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think about the Russell 2000, it's, it's imperfect, but sort of as a proxy on small and middle sized businesses, it's not really small since they're mostly, um, you know, these are public equities, but it's more of that orientation than the S&P 500. And what's interesting is you saw back in the late nineties, the ratio just sort of skyrocketed, really amazing seeing how much the NASDAQ outperformed the Russell 2000 came right down similar to the last chart bottomed out in the mid two thousands. And then the NASDAQ has been outperforming really again, till the middle part of this year and almost identical to the prior chart. And there's a lot of overlap or correlation of the attributes of this chart compared to the prior one. But again, you're seeing something that appears to be sort of rotating. When I think about um, growth outperforming value, you mentioned secular stagnation. I really think about, um, you know, it, there's almost like this growth scarcity. And so when there's less growth, those stocks that are growing the fastest, you know, your Amazons, your Tesla, those are most coveted. And when you have more growth, more spread out growth, um, those are times when uh, that, you know, you, you, you have less growth scarcity. So you have more of an abundance of growth, if you will. And then that, you know, things sort of uh, equalize at that point. It doesn't mean necessarily, it doesn't have to mean that uh, the actual growth inherent in the tech stocks stops. It just means that they get sort of the value differential between those and all the rest of the stuff sort of collapses or, or compresses. That may be, it certainly looks at it, this chart and comparing it to the last cycle, looks like um, some, of, some of what we're seeing. Um, similarly, uh, this is U.S. equity prices versus the rest of the world, and we're using the MSCI USA and the MSCI world versus uh, the U.S. This chart goes back further than the ones I've been showing, but again, bottomed out in the mid-2000s, U.S. equities went on a major uh, bout of outperformance, 15 years of it's outperformance amazing. versus the world. I mean, it's really just... I, you know, I, if this is reversing, this will be, um, you know, we're not looking at Japan here versus the rest of the world in the mid eighties, but, uh, 
it, this chart too, and again, because this chart goes back a little further, you can't quite see it, but you can you can barely make it out. But this also has peaked over, appears to have peaked over the last uh, couple months here. Um, and again, so this isn't this is something else that might be um, more interesting to see how this this sort of develops. This does feed into to some degree our our thesis on the dollar, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and usually, um, you know, when you see a weakening dollar. Uh, that's an environment where you can see um, uh, equities from other parts of the world to start to do well, particularly emerging market equities. But it's interesting to look at this chart. Um, and again, I mentioned way back in the presentation that um, we might be in the midst of this, this paradigm shift, perhaps to not only a um, hesitation as it relates to fiscal spending, but actually maybe an embracing of that. Um, and that might be an environment where maybe you see more inflation um, and you know, capped interest rates. Um, again, sort of speculating here, but um, that is that may be um, sort of putting an end to this period of just dramatic outperformance of U.S. equities versus global. I remember looking at a, a research piece, maybe it was five years ago or so, that talked about just since the U.S. has been outperforming so much recently, that you know, historically after periods of outperformance like this, over the next five to 10 years, they underperform relative to global equities, right? There's you know, like, you can't always outperform. And then it got even more That's right. overstretched to where we are today. Um, and the rest of the world is, has less growth stocks in the, a lot of those indices. Like outside, if you look at EM, um, uh, Asia has been doing the best. Asia has a lot of technology stocks. Yep. Whereas LATAM and EMEA, they're more uh, the indices are filled with more financials and commodity driven businesses and things like that. So if you do truly get that pickup in global growth, you would think that those companies that have seen kind of the slowdown because of what's going on, start to see that earnings growth finally come back in, into play. Yeah, absolutely. I think you mentioned two things that you know, it's, it's difficult to say this is, this is the, the sort of trend shift, because as you mentioned five years ago, there were folks calling for this. You can see back during the last recession, 2005, 2009, uh, the ratio went up and came down, and that's really when it started its sort of bull run. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, I mentioned copper prices up well over 25% this year. Uh, that, you know, if we do end up in a world where there's more fiscal spending, maybe there's capped interest rates, um, there's this rebuilding going on in terms of economies in 2021 and beyond, uh, if we hit our growth, you know, the growth uh, uh, target or forecast, I should say, um, that should be an environment where commodities um, might do well. Um, and, you know, just a sort of sneak peek, we have a chart on that in a little bit. Um, but there, there again, you know, you might see uh, areas like uh, LATAM, as you mentioned, sort of, you know, that might be a, a, a world where those um, equities can really start to outperform. I don't know if you saw on Bloomberg News this morning, there was an article, I didn't read the whole thing, but it was talking about uh, the rosy um, employment picture in Australia, which, as we know, is uh, has a lot of employment related to natural resources selling to China. So uh, I feel like you're seeing the positivity and you know commodity prices being reflected towards that job growth that Australia is seeing, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I did catch that story. I sort of actually stopped and read it. I thought it was noteworthy. It was a pretty, it was a pretty good report for Australia. I mean, obviously Australia has done pretty good <laughs> ridding itself of the um, coronavirus. Um, so there is that, but yeah, it's a, it's a very commodity driven uh, economy, particularly for developed markets. So to see that level of, of job growth I think um, not only is interesting in the context of commodities, but it's also interesting to, to sort of think about when you think about the ultimate recovery for all of the global economies. Um, you know, you've had such a, so much suppressed demand. Uh, a lot of the world has been in their homes. I think there's going to be a lot of interest in getting out of their homes, and you know, there's there's a there's a scenario there where there's a pretty um, robust level of getting outside and just you know sort of doing things and um, you know so on and so forth. And if there's a government uh, oriented fiscal spending, uh, uh, infrastructure, whatnot, that just sort of, you know, can really propel that. Um, and so that level of uh, price appreciation has led to high valuations. Uh, this is from our friend Gerard Manak. He here, uh, we're looking at the CAPE ratios for the U.S. versus global non-U.S. So it's pretty linked to the prior chart I just showed. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's slightly different. The red line is slightly different, but you can see that the U.S. CAPE ratio is well over 30 uh, for the MSCI, um, and then the, the USA MSCI, and then global equities are much cheaper down at sort of 15. Um, you know, obviously there's some compositional differences, but just on, just on the surface, uh, 
uh, it makes a lot of sense. Prices have gone up for the better part of 15 years and valuations are a lot higher and we're seeing that here. So it's not just the, the sort of price appreciation relative to growth. It's also um, that the actual uh, multiple that the market is, is applying, at least in the context of CAPE, is, uh, is much higher than it is to global equities. Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely, if you want to be uh, buying something that's not up a lot, you have to look away from the U.S. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, when those moves happen, everyone kind of jumps on the bandwagon, right? So I feel like when you see those moves, and we, we, you kind of saw glimpses of this um, in kind of November and December with the virus news coming in, where you'd see everyone selling tech moving into some of the more cyclical names. Um, but if, you know, if that picks up steam, um, there could be some really interesting, interesting changes in the, uh, the what what becomes the flavor of the day, if you will, right? Yep. Yeah. This correlates really well with that growth versus value chart that we showed, um, and you know, just the sort of most the the most outperformance in a day. Um, and if you just look at value, I mean, value just you know one interpretation at least is looking at the cape ratio, and here we're seeing that the value in global non-US equities um, using this measure is, is, uh, appears to be a lot higher than US equities. And, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about emerging markets uh, with respect to commodities. Um, this is a chart that goes back about six years. This looks at industrial metals. It's a um, sub-index of the S&P GSCI, and that's the red line. And then we're looking at the black line, which is emerging markets over global equity. So again, ratios, we love those ratios. And uh, here you can see that it, really in 2014 through 2020, um, you saw that these sort of moved together. So as industrial metal prices fell, uh, equities under uh, emerging market equities underperformed global equities. And then when that bottomed out back in 2015, 2016, the last oil crisis or a, a, you know oil crash, I should say, nothing compared to this year, uh, we saw emerging market uh, prices and uh, industrial metals rise. They peaked around 2018 and they fell back down. And now we we're in an environment where industrial metals are rising and uh, emerging markets are sort of sitting, you know, sort of sitting down there. You mentioned some of the compositional issues with, with, uh, with Asia. I mean, that maybe is part of the story, but I think it's really um, Latin America. And, you know, we haven't seen that those markets really begin to sort of recover um, so as you look around the globe, you know, you can look at non-US equities, you can look at um, uh, emerging market equities as areas that could probably do pretty well in an environment of not only recovery, but one where we actually start to see uh, inflation and more an embracement of fiscal spending. Yep. Okay, so that's FX. Um, talked about some of that, you know, obviously US equity markets have been on a tear, great year, valuations are high. I think we'll turn to currencies. Um, we have a we, we have a sort of a, a medium term view on the dollar and that is that we expect the dollar to go lower. Um, and if you look at this chart here from Deutsche Bank, um, you know, they point out that, and this chart goes pretty far back, goes back to the 1970s. And they sort of point out, you have these crises, um, they have the Plaza Accord in the mid eighties, you have got September 11 and they sort of note that the dollar tends to uh, get weaker after those. Um, you know, I, I think for us, when we look at the amount of debt that the U.S. has printed the budget deficits, um, the uh, reduction of buying by some uh, international buyers or buyers that had been buying, like China and Russia, um, and uh, this 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 perhaps paradigm shift towards more of an embracement of fiscal spending and less caring about the budget deficit. That to us is an environment where um, you, know, you could certainly see the dollar being weaker. Uh, we talked about um, commodities um, in that environment. You know, can't exactly say which happens first, but that's probably an environment where commodity prices are rising versus the dollar, um, and so that sort of comes into play here. Um, we're we're sort of in the very near term, a little more neutral on the dollar, just seeing how the very near term sort of plays out. Uh, but I think over the medium term, we're expecting the next big move in the dollar to be one where the dollar gets weaker, uh, as a general rule. I you know. I, <laughs> You certainly want to sort of think about, um, and we'll you know sort of talk about it in this presentation. Um, when you say weaker dollar, you have to sort of ask versus what. Um, we're definitely in an environment where governments across the globe are um, spending more, have are running uh, higher budget deficits. The U.S. dollar is, is you know obviously the reserve currency, so it's um, a little bit more unique. Um, but you know, I think, you know, our thoughts are the dollar will get weaker over time. And uh, if everyone's doing that at once, it may be play out most against 
real assets, gold, uh, equities, um, you know, things like Bitcoin, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, this chart here is looking at the dollar versus the S&P. It goes back about a year and you can just see, this is the Bloomberg dollar index. Uh, you can see that, you know, just sort of optically, it's pretty correlated. The dollar gets, uh, I should say the dollar is inverted here. The dollar gets stronger, equities go down, dollar gets weaker, S&P uh, goes up. Um, so there's, you know, these are all sort of, all of these, these different things we're talking about are sort of interplaying in one big macro picture, but the thesis of a weaker dollar is one where um, really it's playing out. I think, you know, some part of that is playing out in, in seeing asset prices generally do better. If you think that your dollar is worth uh, less every day, you tend, you know, you'll want to buy something else. You'll maybe keep less money or institutions will keep less money in cash outright to the extent they can. And they'll put that in things that they think will sort of, you know, hold value versus a dollar that appears to be weakening. Sure. So that's, a do that's our dollar view. I mean, I think that sort of, that conversation bleeds into um, what we'll, we'll close up on here, which is uh, real assets. Um, we started off this conversation talking about, um, uh, you know, wealth inequality to some degree, the fact that the, you know, we've, we've relied a lot on central banks over the last 10 years um, because it was sort of worked coming out of the financial crisis. Uh, this is a really interesting chart here. This looks at the Bloomberg Commodity Index. That's the white line. Um, these are normalized returns. So they, they, their percentage changes going back to 1994. And then it's versus the S&P uh, 500 total return index. And you can see they were for, you know, from 1994 till about 2011, pretty much moving together. I mean, there was periods where equities outperformed and around 2000, we talked about that bubble. And then it, and then it sort of mean reverted back to pretty close, pretty similar back in 2002. And then we move into 2011, 2012, and commodity prices actually go lower, and uh, stock prices just take a rocket ship move, uh, move up to the moon. And in the lower panel, I just have the size of the Fed's balance sheet. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll just sort of uh, throw that out there that you know, back in 2009, 2010, when the, we first started doing the Fed started expanding its balance sheet, I think there was a lot of expectation for. Um, inflation, you know, there's even talk of hyperinflation. And what we, what we really ended up having was uh, that excess liquidity went into uh, certain markets. And in this case, you know, it definitely went into the S&P 500 and it didn't translate into more broad inflation. And I think, you know, you can make the case that moving into an environment where you're doing more fiscal spending, where um, money is being spread around more, uh, that's an environment where, you know, there's at least a realistic shot of, you know, having inflation actually sort of come into play. That's an environment where you might see sort of commodities um, start to do well. So to the extent we are, we, we you know, this isn't just a, a head fake and we, we do um, embrace more fiscal spending. I think, you know, that's an environment where you'll, you'll start to perhaps see uh, more inflation. If we get log jam in politics, and uh, and we're already seeing perhaps some of those stories today, where there's some discussion about um, you know limiting what the Fed, um, different Fed facilities. Uh, if you start ending, uh, you know, there's there's I, I just should say there's more uh, discussion about um, the fiscal spending. Secondarily, there's even some attempts to sort of um, limit even what the Fed can do. Um, but if we don't get uh, find ourselves in an environment where the government is, um, for better or worse. Uh, embarking on this this uh, journey of fiscal spending, uh, I think you know the economy and our markets are going to be looking for um, support for, from somewhere. And if that ends up being uh, the Fed, that's probably an environment that uh, tends to be more deflationary and an environment where you might see charts like this sort of continue. And that just sort of uh, expands some of the inequalities that we've seen that lead to. Um, you know, just lead uh, politically and socially to some destabilization, um, probably getting more protests and sort, you know, things like that uh, at their extremes. But it's an interesting chart to look at. And I think, you know, we're, we're somewhere in the midst of a crossroads here to figure out whether we want more of this or, you know, some of these things need to sort of mean revert again. Yeah, isn't it amazing, you know, post uh, global financial crisis that the knee jerk reaction to quantitative easing was that you'll see inflation and rates go higher. And I mean, rates, it's weird, rates would rise into the uh, expectations of QE. Yep. And then once the actual buy, bond buying started, rates would uh, rise, right? Yep. Um, but uh, the inflation never came, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, people it's really worried about it for the last decade. Yeah. 
it's really instructive about how market narratives, I mean, I think there's this idea that markets know best and, you know, sometimes that tends to be the case, but there's also a case where market narratives sort of take hold and they don't, they don't really, they don't work out that way. And I guess that's what, what makes a market. Um, just sort, just sort of uh, rounding off since we're talking about, uh, we've talked about the dollar. Um, obviously, you know, here's uh, take a, taking a look at Bitcoin, which um, this chart is pretty stale now. When we made the chart, uh, Bitcoin was at twenty thousand as we're uh, recording this. Uh, last I checked, it was uh, just under twenty three thousand. So Bitcoin moved up a lot. Some folks will call it sort of, uh, you know, this this digital coal, digital gold, excuse me. Um, and I you know what we have here uh, is a list of all the different um, institutional headlines for 2020. Um, you know, we've got a company MicroStrategy that bought uh, over uh, $400 million, well, now has $400 million of Bitcoin. Uh, we have Square uh, putting Bitcoin or in cryptocurrencies onto their platform. Same thing with PayPal. We've got Paul Tudor Jones and uh, Stanley Drunkenmiller talking about Bitcoin. And I think all of this can sort of get wrapped up in the conversation that we were having uh, about whether we go down this road of just more fiscal spending and what that means and how investors might look to sort of protect their capital. Certainly gold is one area that they might look. Uh, I think equities, investors might, um, you know, take a mixed view on interest rates, depending on what, if any, interest rate cap looks, looks like. And, you know, different things like Bitcoin and digital assets are another area that I think um, this year there's been a lot more interest um, whether we're in the midst of an extreme bubble right now or just witnessing the sort of the institutional adoption, you know, we'll have to sort of see how that plays out. Um, but it's a really interesting thing to watch just um, how different this um, run up in prices in cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin is compared to 2017, which was really um, the more of a retail um, yeah. thing. And this is much more institutional. And I think this plays back to this, this potentially shifting into uh, a different paradigm uh, of being repulsed by um, large fiscal deficits to really just saying, you know, let's, let's turn on the printing presses and, um, you know, start sending checks to folks. Yeah. I mean, de definitely seems like uh, larger adoption institutionally and acceptance of Bitcoin. And so that the big question is, will that continue? And uh, cause you're, you're, it's diverging from gold, usually gold and Bitcoin kind of move together and they're totally diverging right now. Gold's down, Bitcoin's up big. So um, either, you know, one needs to come down or we're in a new paradigm, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the midst of such a strong movement, it's, it's hard to tell, is this, is this the pickup, the, uh, you know, the digital, the, I'm sorry, the institutional adoption, or is this just, you know, just a, another 2017 to some degree with sort of a different flavor that remains to behold, but it's an area that we're, we're, we're definitely looking at and we think a lot about. What, what's kind of, uh, what have you been doing during the pandemic to, to, have you picked up new hobbies? Have you been going, I used to, used to do photography. Have you, what, what have you been doing? Anything different to, to pass the time these days? I know you have a, a, a beautiful kid at home now too. So I, I did buy, I actually bought a guitar. Um, so I, there's, there's some great new software that's pretty helpful trying to learn that. So, um, I've been messing around with the guitar a little bit and even a ukulele. So I've <laughs> been uh, doing, a little, doing a little bit of that. And uh, when I can, I get up to the mountains and I, I, you know, over the course of the summer, I was doing a lot of hiking, trying to get outside. I thought that was something um, that's been, that's been really helpful um, over the course of this pandemic is getting outside in nature. And then of course, spending time with, um, with my son, Benjamin. And so do you, do you miss the office? Do you want to come back? Do you want, or, you know, how do you feel about uh, the work from home? Yeah. Now, I mean, now that we're like, we're month 10. I keep thinking about the, uh, you know, the Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day. And uh, except we don't get to learn the piano, I guess you're, you're learning to play the guitar a little bit, but yeah. you know, we're month uh, 10, I think now of doing this work from home and uh, it is getting a little bit old, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just was thinking back. I, I, I think as a firm, we were talking about this pretty early on in January. As you know, um, one of the guys that works for me has family in Wuhan, so we had a good insight um, into what was happening. Um, and so we were we we were we, we were aware of how, where this was, you know, going. I don't think we were aware that it would play out this way by any means. So I, I particularly as we we're getting to February and early March, I had a sense we would end up here. But I never thought it would be sort of you know 10, 11 months in the later. I thought it'd be we'd be out two months and sort of be back. Um, I, I, I do, I, yeah, I do miss the office. I want to come back, um, you know, 
a number of days per week. I uh, still like some mix of uh, working from home. And I think that, you know, that that's pretty interesting to me is the, you know, whether that's work three, four days from the office and a couple days, a day or two from home or something along those lines, I think is, is really interesting. It is, um, th there's a lot of efficiencies, you know, you don't have to commute to work. And then there's some inefficiencies in terms of the team. We have these great tools now, these, this great tech to sort of um, facilitate working as a group. But it's also something um, I think missed um, from sitting in trading desk and being able to turn around behind somebody and, and make a quick comment without sending them, uh, you know, a whole instant message or ping, which, you know, just there's a little bit more friction there. So I think there's some things that are gained and some things that are lost from being out of the office. And I'm, but on the whole, I've been quite surprised how, um, how smoothly it's worked uh, as a firm and, and even just within the teams I'm part of. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'd, I have a long commute, one of the longer commutes at yeah. the firm. Um, three days a week would be nice in the office and a couple days at home just to not drive. And also, but there's days you get a lot more done if you don't, you know, yeah. if you can just focus and not have anybody be bothering you. So I think the, maybe a more balanced approach is maybe the the benefit of what comes out of all this. Yeah. I, I, I think that plays out on work and on a society level. I mean, if you want to, a lot, we, we, I think we are moving pretty fast as a society. A lot of, you know, we're still doing tech and all that, but there's, <laughs> Folks have had a lot of time to sort of contemplate and reassess. And I think that's part of what we're seeing with the movements of people deciding, you know, lifestyle might matter a little bit more than living in the middle of a city. So there's a lot of, uh, I think there's been a lot of deep introspection at the societal level, as well as the individual level. So it's something that that's been really interesting to watch the good and the bad of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll hopefully look back on this in a couple of years and say that it created changes for the better as a, as a society. Right. I agree. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, I look forward to seeing you in person next time, hopefully uh, after the holidays and uh, wish you the best to you and your family. Yep. Happy holidays. Take care. All right. Take care.